All right. Looks like we have a whole bunch. We have a passel uh, of folk listening to us live on Discord. Good. Good. You should be. Uh, we got. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and admit something to you guys uh, in the show. It's been it was a hard weekend for me. Uh, I have friends, intelligentsia um, who pay attention to the world and send me things, mostly videos, uh, sometimes articles, but mostly videos from Rumble and BitChute. And sometimes occasionally YouTube will will screw up and not censor a video um, with truth in it. And I had to consume all that. And I was like, wow, there's there's so much evidence out there right now. I, I don't even know how we're going to get to all of it, but we're going to do our very, 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 very best. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, Zach, I don't even want to get started yet. So just go ahead and play the music and then then we'll do what we got to do. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, proudly brought to you from the SDS Import Studio. If you want quality that's affordable, visit sdsimports.com. We don't just talk guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics because guns are politics. Now sit back and listen louder to your co-host, CEO of Full 30, Jared Markle, and your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All right, guys. Uh, Step number one. Uh, if you're live and you have questions, go ahead and ask them. Uh, in honor of International Women's Day and uh, International Women Pandering Month, you know, that's the great thing, Zach and Jared, about having app television, whether it's because they're all the same, whether it's Hulu or Netflix or, pa- or um, Peacock or Paramount Network or whatever. If you ever if you ever wake up on the first or second of the month and you're and you think, oh, no, I don't know which minority group we're supposed to pander to this month. Which group are we supposed to pander to? Calm down. Just go turn on your app TV and across the top, it'll tell you which group you're supposed to blindly pander to. And I'll give you a hint. It's not Caucasian men. (laughs) It will never be Caucasian. The answer will never be straight white men or Christians. That will never be the thing. (laughs) So if you're wondering, you're like, I wonder if this is honor white Christian men month. No, the answer is no, it is not. Uh, But this March, you're like, well, what's March? Isn't October women's boob, you know, boob protection month or what what do we call it? Um, Breast cancer uh, awareness month. No, this, it, there's another one. There's like the it's it has the the T I T word in it. Protect it's the T's. Something like that. <laughs> also, I don't think that's a censor word. I think we're fine. Um, well, if we have kids listening, we we'll probably censor it. <laughs> They're like, "Oh, what is that, mom?" Um, no, there was there were um, there were last year they had stickers and patches, and it didn't it didn't say breast cancer awareness. It said, "Oh, can you you guys can't remember?" I have no idea. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll figure it out. But anyway, uh, so there that's October because that's what your mom said. She goes, I thought October was women's. Like, no, 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 no. Um, March is International Women's Month. Protect the Tatas. Have, is that it? The Tatas? Protect the Tatas? Oh, save that, the Tatas. Save the Tatas. That's, that's it. it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> save the Tatas. Okay. Um, but in order, we're, we're not doing this episode from the kitchen because our microphones won't stretch that far. Um, so sorry. Uh, but we have for you, ladies in the audience, if you would like to be the apple of your husband's eye, and you say, I already am, say, okay, well, even more so. Uh, Miss Nancy wrote this cookbook. It's called Ranch Cooking. It Ain't Freaking Frittatas. And uh, it's filled with dinner recipes and, and uh, Dip- snack recipes and celebrity recipes yeah there's professor paul's tactical chili there's the ogre burger oh, by yeah. zachary spicy apple pork chops uh tender beef short ribs fiery meatballs um a pepperoni pizza soup cheeseburger soup I don't know chicken I noodle that. soup loaded potato soup uh you know what your mom oh muffins 
all kinds of good stuff. There's ton. This is just you want this book. It's yeah. beautiful. It's full color. It was, it's written and it's signed by Miss Nancy. And uh, if you go over to the store at the shop SOTG, you can get it. Yep. Remind me, did I did I do that cover? No, your mom did. Okay, I couldn't remember. I think not the picture, but the design. Because mom, Wait, I don't no. think mom's ever used Photoshop in her life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and, give them the pint glass update. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, just so everyone knows. Uh, to those of you who have already ordered one, uh, we're getting them now. It took a little bit. It's been taking a little bit longer to get them than I anticipated because uh, apparently the machine was broken, so he had to COVID. run a bunch of tap. Yeah, because COVID. COVID. <laughs> uh, the machine. The, there was something wrong with the machine, so he had to use all the cups he was going to print on to do tests. So he had to order more. So, uh, those are on their way. They'll be here soon. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, uh, in addition to the return of the eight freaking Frittatas cookbook, we also have official SOTG branded pint glasses, which are pretty badass, if I do say so myself. Both are available on shopsotg.com. They're both on the homepage, so you can see both of them right there. They're awesome. They're great. There you go. uh, There you go. All right. So, just throw that in there. Oh, well, there you go. Thank you, Zach, for working so hard to give everybody cool deals and specials and all that stuff. Uh, and remember, if you guys have questions, throw them in there. Let's go ahead and move on to our Duracoat finished firearm section of the week. For those of you guys that are watching, uh, you're watching the video, if you see the video, uh, if you're on Discord, you can. And if you go to the, if they if they go to studentofthegun.com when this show publishes, they can watch the video, right, Zach? Mm-hmm. If they watch it from the server. Yep. And or you can okay. check it out on our uh, smart TV apps. Okay. Uh, you see me shooting those guns in there. Those guns are all Duracoat guns. Some of them are d- guns that I did myself, and some of them are guns that uh, I sent off to Duracoat to have done, uh, specifically the red, the, the, the fire extinguisher gun. And um, Steve Lauer died last week. Yeah. It's rough. We've known Steve for a long, long time. In fact, I met Steve at my first ever shot show, and I remember that because he never let me live it down. Oh, yeah. He never let you live it down. How so? Uh, that was I met him when I was very hungover. Oh, I remember. <laughs> and every year after that, he's like, "Oh, I'm surprised to see you're not hungover today." Yeah, oh. uh, you made an impression on him. <laughs> I did. He, uh, was, he he was impressed that I was there working after I had that much fun the a, night before. After, I said, oh, after I'm seeing dedicated. the previous evening. <laughs> I'm dedicated to my Did, craft. <laughs> didn't you? Weren't you on an elevator with him? Didn't you end up on an elevator? Is that not, isn't that how he knew that you had spent a little bit too much time being happy? Uh, I, I, I think that was what happened. No, yeah. we, I was coming off the elevator as he was getting on. Oh. And I was, oh. uh, I was in the elevator with with a woman and uh there who is now my wife by the way who is now your wife or was not or your what wife? i i don't think she was my wife she wasn't your wife at the time she was your fiance my fiance yeah uh, that fancy french word holy cow i can't believe we've been together that long now yeah so He's... steve was one of those guys that i was introduced to by another by another mentor uh my friend charlie um charlie cutshaw who is not with us anymore uh charlie was real big into duracoat and this was years we were still living in ohio when this happened and i went to a shot show i don't know which one it was way back in the in the uh in the early 2000s and uh charlie's like oh you yeah you need to know you need to know these guys and uh, so i went over to the booth and i was like hi i'm paul markle and charlie cutshaw says i need to know you guys and they're like, oh, okay, you know, what do you do? And, and I said, well, you know, write for Harris and so on and so forth. Oh, okay, you know. And we got to talking and and we became basically instantly friends. Started working together. Um, and uh, Steve sent me a kit. And this is way back before the Canon can technology. 
uh, this was back when you, you pretty much had to have an air compressor and airbrushes and all that stuff, you know. Uh, and, of course, they sell all that. They don't sell air compressors, but they sell the brushes and the hoses and all that, those things. And, yeah, but, and he sent me a template pattern. And I did the best I could. And I, I was like, this is the best I could do. It was my first job. Time. And he said, ah, that wasn't too bad, but we'll, we'll work with you. And uh, as time went by, they had, he had a, uh, they had a do-it-yourself kit, but you still had to mix. You had to, you, they sent you two things, and you had to mix them and, and so forth. And, jeez, uh, you remember the, the NRA in Houston, Jared? How could you forget? Yeah. So at NRA in Houston, which was 2013, I went into the booth and I said, hey, I want to do some more projects. I said, you know, you want to work with us? So you want to promote the, the do-it-yourself kit? And he's like, no, don't want to do that. He said, I've got something coming that's going to make that irrelevant. I was like, oh. And then he told me about it. He says, I was in Europe last year for EWA, and I met this guy that does a can inside of a can. He goes, it looks like a regular spray can, a normal can on the outside, but inside there's actually two cans. So you can put the hardener. If you guys know anything about Duracoat product, it's not just paint. See, because regular paint will just chip off and, you know, and the sun will bake it off and so forth. It's, it's cheap. It's inexpensive. It's cheap. That's what it is. Duracoat's not. So you, but. The color has to remain separate from the hardener for obvious reasons because you can't store them together because they'll get hard. Uh, so Steve's like, it's going to be perfect. He said, I've, I've got to deal with this guy. He said, so just hold off. He goes, hold off on your next project. And as soon as this stuff's ready, I'll let you know. And I was like, Roger that. And, it's, and to his word, you know, as soon as it was, uh, we got samples. And he's actually, the, he improved it. Over the years, he's like, no, this is we got it better. Uh, at, at first, it was a three day. When you broke the seal, when you cracked the seal, you had, you had forty eight hours to use it, and then it was going to be done, hardened. And then uh, they they tinkered with it because he was kind of the uber genius of that. And he's like, you get now, you have a week. You still only have a week, but it, it doesn't. If you're smart, you don't need that anyway. Yeah, you know, because you line up, you you pre think out your projects. But what Steve did was he took the high-end gun refinishing and he put it into the hands of the individual person. Whereas before, if you wanted to do a high-end, a really nice aftermarket finish on your gun, you had to send it to somebody or you had to have air compressor and brushes and, and all that stuff, you know. Um, you know, and an air vac system and things like that. And so most people are like, ah, I don't want to invest in all that just to do two guns or whatever. And that's, that is the, that was the genius of Steve Lauer. Steve Lauer, uh, he, he was the incredibly hardworking man. He had several businesses. Uh, actually, I didn't even realize the breadth and scope of, of all the businesses that he had assembled and run and put together uh, until we were in summer of 2020 when we were there yeah, at we the Duracoat there. shop. Uh, and the, here's the good news. You want to know the good news for you guys? You still can benefit from his wisdom. When we went... Uh, in the summer of 2020, in 2020, uh, we went uh, to Wisconsin, and uh, we were part of the Duracoat University online course production. And it's it's done, it's ready, and it's there. And even though Steve has left us, you can still benefit from his wisdom. Uh, and that is a good thing. Um, I... I could spend probably the whole show talking about, you know, the, the, the various stories and the things. He was an extremely generous person. Uh, if you know what the, the NRA, it's the NRA Foundation. The NRA has multiple different organizations, right? And the NRA Foundation is designed, it, it's, for, it's a charitable organization designed to provide money for uh, education. Uh, most often and specifically youth education 
The NRA Foundation has given grants to the 4-H Shooting Sports Program, to the Boy Scouts of America, and every single year, uh, every NRA show, Steve would, not only would he donate a really nice firearm to be raffled off uh, for money, but he would go and he would he would get in the raffle and he would buy the raffle tickets and he would buy a table and he was an extremely generous person. And if you are a member uh, of a youth, whether you're a teacher or whether your kids have benefited from the NRA Foundation's uh, donations, uh, Steve was a part of that. He was a big part of that. And we were very fortunate uh, a couple of different times to be able to to sit and have dinner with Steve and his family at the NRA uh, Foundation banquet uh, at the NRA show. I He's going to be was missed. The first time I met him, I, no, I'm was it? it? I'm pretty sure that yeah, what you're talking about with the the NRA banquet dinner mm-hmm. when we got an invite to the table. I think that was the first time I yeah. ever met anybody at Duracoat. Oh, well, now, now that you mentioned that, I'm like that was that was the first time I met them. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, He's going to be missed. He was a great man, uh, uh, a, a genius when it came to his industry. And uh, we're going to continue. He's, his journey has ended, but we're going to continue to support uh, and help carry on his dream and his mission. And Amy, uh, for those of you that know, if you don't know, it doesn't matter to you. It, it works. But uh, his, his, his daughter, Amy, uh, is the CEO of Duracoat. And uh, she is going to continue, and the people at Duracoat are going to continue. Uh, so, share some love with them. DuracoatFirearmFinishes dot com. That's right, uh, or studentofthegun dot com slash Duracoat. Yeah. And we had another kick in the in the stomach. Uh, Charlie Watson from Atlas Defense. Those of you who. Uh, Atlas isn't you know quite as well known as Duracoat is, but uh, a lot of you guys know Atlas because you bought the the pimp hand lowers, and you know we've spent a lot of time with them over the years. We've filmed over at their shop and and so forth. And uh, Charlie had had some health problems, but nobody thought he was going to pass. Nobody was expecting him. And uh, last week he died in his sleep, and it was a shock to everybody. So. Uh, yeah, kind of a somber week for us here. Kind of a, kind of a kick in the stomach. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on, ladies and gentlemen. SDS Imports supports the show. I, I would appreciate it if you would support them. And one of the ways they support the show is actually by giving away guns. And uh, so you guys can win one uh, this month. The the giveaway, the SDS Imports giveaway for this month uh, is a TAR-12P. It's a semi-automatic, gas-operated 12-gauge shotgun with detachable magazines, and they're even going to throw in a 20-round drum for you guys. So there's that. Uh, You have 22 days, 22 hours, and 13 minutes to get in. Go to SOTGGiveaway.com and sign up right now and make sure that you're supporting uh, our friends at SDS Imports. Oh, bollocks. I haven't talked to my friend Charlie over there. I need to call him and ask him to make sure his health is okay. Because I don't don't need to be losing any more friends. Mother lovers, you need to not go. Yep. Uh, You need to stay. Uh, I stayed, right? Yeah. I stayed. Uh, You need to stay, too. So, Uh, Zach, you want to go ahead and uh, uh, remind people, especially new listeners. Hi, new listeners. Hi. Hi. I'm glad you're here. Um, Remind them what they should do. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong. But 
you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Oh, yes, indeed. Brownells bullet points. Well, we got uh, Brownells is another company, uh, and I didn't mention it, but I should. Uh, Duracoat has been with us since the very beginning. Uh, since the since the very beginning of Student of the Gun, uh, they've been with us, and we appreciate that. And I hope you guys let them know that you appreciate it. Another company that's been with us for a long, 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 long time uh, is Brownells. Uh, so you should be throwing them some love. But what's going on at Brownells? Did we play the Brownells? Ba dum bum bum. All right, bing, bang, boom. Uh, our buddies over there in Iowa, over there in Grinnell, Iowa. And if you're cruising up and down Interstate 80 uh, and you're by Grinnell, you just hit your blinker and pull off and take a little bit of a break and go in and, and uh, shop around at the, uh, at the shop. I went to the new product section, which is always fun, and they have NVG40. Dual tube night vision from AGM Global. And I was like, whoa, what the what now? Uh, yep, a generation three level two night vision. Uh, and they are not free, but they are available. Uh, and you can you can order them directly from Brownells. So that is pretty righteous. That's pretty cool. And then of course, once you do that, you're gonna want to buy a helmet from Hardhead Veterans. Um that's the official uh, what a brain bucket company. The official brain bucket friend of student of the gun, hardhead veterans. <laughs> you want a bump guard? You need a brain bucket, uh, something to keep your 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 noggin together. Uh, I, you know what we need to do, Jared and Zach, and and I've been wanting to do this, but it's been kind of cold, and windy, and yeah, whatever. And I got to do it outside. Uh, kind of demonstrate the importance of a brain bucket or a bump guard. People are like, I'm not a crazy. What do you think you're going to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take Bob out there, you know, our buddy Bob, and uh, I'm going to put a helmet on. I'll, actually, before, I'm not going to put a helmet on him at first. I'm going to take a beer bottle. I'm going to chuck it at his noggin in super slow-mo. And then I'll chuck it at his noggin with a helmet on. A lot of people are out there like, oh, that's dumb. Why would you need that? Um, you know, a person with you know, you got your super cool blaster and you got your Gucci gold triggered three thousand dollar Glock and all that, and you got a bare head and a moron with a half a brick or a beer bottle can take you out. What? No, I got this salient arms three thousand dollar AR. Yeah, and a moron with a piece of brick a broken piece of uh, cinder block or a beer bottle in a crowd 25 yards away and they take you out by hitting you in the noggin with a freaking beer bottle or a half a brick. You ever think about that? No, you didn't, did you? You're welcome. You're welcome. I didn't mean for this to be a helmet talk, but we're like, oh, I don't need a helmet. I'm not stupid and paranoid like you. It's like, hmm. You know, man, human men for 2,000 years have known we should put something around this. This is important. Let's put something around this to keep objects from crashing into it. You know, <laughs> nah, half a brick, not even a full brick. Yeah, not a, even a full brick. Actually, uh, half a, a beer bottle, a half a brick is better because it, it, it fly. It throws better. Yeah. If you take a regular brick and break it in half, it actually throws better than a, a whole brick. Yeah. Speaking um, from experience here. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Uh, and you're and uh, you're like, oh, it's, uh, just a, bo- a glass beer bottle thrown from the arm of a hu- uh, an adult human male into your noggin is going to. I won't die. No, you, no, you might not die. You uh, you will die if a piece of uh, if a half a cinder block hits you in the skull. You will die. Uh, so why? How do we get to helmets? Well, because night vision. You got 
you're going to get night vision. You got to have a, a thing. Um, yeah, and our buddies, I didn't even mean to mention this, but uh, yeah, the Hardhead Veterans guys, they have bump guards uh, and they have um, regular ballistic helmets too. Uh, so Brownells has night vision. It's in stock. They have new night, they have new models, and then they have the models that they previously had. And if you didn't know that, go to brownells.com and click on the tab, new products. And if you haven't done that in a while, you probably should. You're like, oh, I didn't even know that existed, or I didn't know they had that. Now I do. And maybe I need one of those. I don't know. Maybe you do. Uh, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate uh, from those guys is that uh, they are constantly uh, filling the catalog with new products. And because it's hard for me, to, quite frankly, it's hard for me to keep up with all of the new stuff that's constantly coming out. Holy B A L L S. Hollow Sun has an IR laser. They've got an IR laser that will, that mounts to a pick rail that you can zero. It's called an Elite IR collimated laser. So if you're one of those guys, you're like, hey, I got myself a, some NVGs, but it's kind of hard to to shoulder and you know my rifle with the NVG so I'm like <laughs> Jared peas and carrots peanut butter and jelly uh lamb and tuna fish <laughs> lamb and tuna fish <laughs> <laughs> oh hey, this this that percentage of the audience just got that but uh, if you've got nods or NVGs the new the young kids call them nods the old guys like me call them NVGs and you want to have the the slickest rifle setup on planet earth you just put an ir laser on it and wherever the laser is pointed that's where the bullet hits and you can see it in complete darkness and the pigs don't have a chance and if you put a can on it you got excited there for a second yeah i did you put a can on the end of that thing and you go and you sneak around the brush in texas and those those big black blobs out there ripping through the soybean fields and rice fields and corn fields and stuff. Wacko. <laughs> they don't. Need, and the cool thing about night hunting hogs with suppressors is they not, they're not sure which direction to run away to. So they kind of just run around in a big circle. Like, you kill hogs at night with lasers. Yes. Yes. You know, the, the whole, Jared, the, the most fun you can have your clothes on thing. We keep testing that. We're like, 15 years ago, a buddy of mine, he's like, oh, you never been prairie dog hunting? I was like, no. He's like, you got to go. It's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. I was like, okay, good. And I went prairie dog hunting. And it was until I went up into a helicopter <laughs> and shot pigs and coyotes from a helicopter. I'm like, okay, most fun you can have with your clothes on. Then we went to Texas, Jared and I, and we put lasers, IR lasers on our rifles and nods and suppressors. And we went out and we shot pigs in complete darkness with IR lasers. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, okay, another most fun you can have with your clothes on. <laughs> uh, so, but wow. Thank you. Uh, I know you guys are like, oh, hello, son. I never buy. Then don't. If you don't like Hollow Sun, you don't want to buy one, don't. But here's the deal. This is an IR laser module that you can zero attached to a pick rail for it's $349 on Brownells. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. That's crazy. Because IR lasers, like modular IR lasers, that you know, so forth, uh, previously were pretty pricey. About, you know, grand or more. Uh, so this might be something you might want to get into. I'm just saying. If you don't want it, you don't need it. But if you, it's kind of like one of those explaining sex to a virgin things, Jared. People who never used night vision and shot and engaged targets with night vision, they're like, yeah, I mean, that shows whatever, you know. But then when you do it, you're like, oh, oh yeah. It's like seeing for the first time. You're like, now I get it. Now I get it. I think that one of my favorite things about the night vision hunt 
that's different from being in a helicopter is how quiet and just amazing it is. When oh, you're, yeah. You're just sitting out there in the middle of the night, and we were in Texas, so there's just wide open sky with stars and everything. It was amazing. Stalking uh, obviously, you can't, yeah, you can't get that in a helicopter because it's loud and whatnot, yeah. but two different types of fun. Stalking up to them piggies in there. <laughs> And that that's, happened to be that's the cool cattle. thing when you get when you get close <laughs> enough to them and you can hear them because oh, they're yeah. over there like <laughs> and there's always one that's that's pushing the other ones around you <laughs> yep nasty animals <laughs> ah and then the last thing i'm gonna say during uh the brownells bullet points is this um thanks to the criminals in washington dc uh, ammo is not going to get cheaper. Uh, if you're waiting, you're like, ah, you know, I've been watching prices and they, eventually they're going to come down to where they were in 2019 and then I'm going to buy a bunch. It's not going to happen. Uh, no, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but if you're waiting for it to get, you know, nine mil ball to get that back down to 18 cents a shot, two, two, three to get back down to, you know, 22, 25 cents a shot, that's not happening. And the, the criminals in Washington, D.C. are going to do everything. Well, inflation, supply, uh, poking the Russian bear with a stick, seeing what he's going to do. Um, it's not coming down. If you need ammo for a gun, whatever flavor it is, 270, 22 Hornet, I don't know what you're shooting. If you need ammo for a gun, because guns... Pretty much are worthless without ammunition, right? You just want to have an expensive stick to hit people with. Uh, if it's available, I'm noticing that uh, the the off calibers, you know, the not the nine two two three seven six two, but the weird off calibers, they kind of come and go. Uh, if you find it and you need it. I'm not telling you to mortgage your house, but here's the deal. If you think, I'll wait six months and it'll be more plentiful or cheaper, that's not happening. That is not happening. Uh, so if you need ammo, if you really need it, buy it. Shop around, do whatever you need to do. But the idea that you can wait, I'll wait till after the next election cycle and ammo prices will come down and it'll be more plentiful. <sighs> no, no. Uh, I know Nostradamus hat here. Nostradamus hat. Remember back in February of 2019, and I told people if you need ammo, buy it now. Remember when I did that? Because the price <laughs> is only going to go up. And some of you, a lot of you guys out there, you're like smiling and nodding your head. You're like, I listened, and I'm cool. And then other people are like, ah, what is that Paul Markle guy know? He doesn't know anything. <laughs> what does Zachary know? That's what I want to know. What does Zachary know? ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed. That is what you should do. Uh, we're going to go jump into the Student of the Gun Homeroom, brought to you by our good buddies at Crossbreed Holsters, another company that's been here from essentially the beginning of Student of the Gun Radio. Matter of fact... Well, I was gonna say, ah. As a matter of fact, I was gonna, I was going to acknowledge him when I when we launched, we did student of the gun TV first and we had Duracoat and we had uh, several sponsors on the TV show. And then we uh, two years later, we decided to do the radio. The first call I made was to Crossbreed and I said, hey, this is what we're going to do. Would you be willing to help us make this show? And they said, yep, we're in. And they've been with us ever since. So. When you go there, use the promo code SOTG so that they know that you know that we know that we all know that we love each other. 
Now Zach can play the music. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Madison Rising, for Dangerous, the theme song for the Student of the Gun Homeroom, Dangerous on Demand, DOD. You guys have heard me yakking about. See, I was a kid in the 70s, but I also have this thing called a mind and a brain and a memory. I've been paying attention my whole life. Right now, during the, the 70s and 80s, there were lots of movies about New York. There was the Warriors movie, right? That was probably one of the most famous movies about New York in the 70s uh, with the, the, the territory, the whole entire city, all five boroughs were carved up into gang territories. Now, it wasn't as colorful as the movie The Warriors, but the truth of the matter is, um, in the 70s, New York was a shite hole. And the crime was out of control because apparently they didn't have enough gun laws. Um, but in the late 80s, into the 90s, Rudy Giuliani came in and he cleaned up the city. He's like, look, this, we've had enough of this crap. Cleaned up the city. Uh, got rid of the the street crime, gentrified it, and you know, and Rudy wasn't responsible for gentrifying it, but it but it became, you know, coffee shops and high end brownstones and all this stuff, right? Well, then you mongoloids in New York say that the Democrat mongoloids uh, who inhabit that uh, place decided let's put a communist in, let's let's make a communist the mayor. So you did. You installed. Then they put in Bloomberg. Bloomberg's not a communist. He's a socialist dictator. Uh, Bloomberg is a scumbag hypocrite. How's that dictate? So, yeah, he had that dictate in his mouth. So, um, yeah, Bloomberg, you're like, you know what? Bloomberg was a, was a socialist tyrant, but let's go full communist. Okay. So you put in uh, a full, full on scumbag communist as your mayor and i've had people say well i don't think new york's that bad i mean is it really as bad as you say it is well, i don't know i don't know you tell me uh, we got a story from ammoland.com and it just dropped on march 7th so it's a pretty new story jared would you help us out what's what's going down in uh, the big apple says horrid attack proves New York subways not sensitive places. This is a pretty long article, and most of the details are at the end, so I'm going to try to hurry up for you here. Okay. says, since the District of Columbia, Columbia versus Heller decision in 2008, gun control advocates have parsed every word of Justice Scalia's opinion for ways in which to continue their campaign against the Second Amendment. Rely upon creative interpretations of dicta, these activists try to twist the landmark gun rights ruling into an endorsement of their anti-gun policies. An example of these efforts is on display in the NRA-supported case New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. The case concerns the validity of New York's discretionary carry licensing regime where the law enforcement is tasked with determining if an applicant has quote-unquote proper cause to carry a firearm for self-defense. In the Heller decision, Scalia stated, quote, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, end quote. Gun control evidence have, advocates have seized on the sensitive places language in an attempt to lend legitimacy to the blanket restrictions on the right to carry for self-defense. Yeah. In their brief defending the May issue licensing regime, New York argued, New York's law is a historically grounded approach to protecting sensitive places of the type that every state, the federal government, and this court have recognized the need to safeguard. The reply <sighs> brief from NYSRPA correctly noted, the plaintiffs do not challenge any of New York's many separate laws prohibiting handguns in specific sensitive places. 
They can test New York's effort to treat virtually the entire Empire State as a sensitive place and to prohibit petitioners from carrying their handguns for self-defense virtually anywhere. This battle surrounding sensitive places loomed large in the briefs. Moreover, a particularly supposed a particular supposed sensitive place was repeatedly invoked by the state, New York City's subways. Mm. Those are not sensitive places. We'll get to the Oh no, in just yeah, a second. yeah. The state's brief cited subways as sensitive places. Moreover, during the November 3rd oral arguments, the New York Solicitor General Barbara Underwood endorsed the notion that subways are sensitive places. In posing a question to Underwood, Justice Samuel Alito said, none of these people has a criminal record. They're all law-abiding citizens. They get off work around midnight, maybe even after midnight. They have to commute home by subway, maybe by bus. When they arrive at the subway station or the bus stop, they have to walk some distance through a high crime area and they apply for a license and they say, look, nobody has told, nobody has said that I'm going to be, I'm going to mug you next Thursday. However, there have been a lot of muggings in this area and I'm scared to death. They do not get licenses. Is that right? And then Underwood defending New York law while responding to Alito in part stated, I think the extra problem in Manhattan is that your hypothetical quite appropriately entailed the subways, entailed public transit. And there are lots of people on the subways, even at midnight, as I can say from personal experience. And that particular specter of a lot of armed people in an enclosed space. Uh, and she also said, well, I think the subways, when there are problems on the subways, they're protected by the transit police. Yeah, they do a great job. Because the idea of proliferating arms on the subway is precisely what terrifies a great many people. Oh, yeah. You can't let the criminals. People... It, it, does it terrify the criminals? Yeah, no. It ter- uh, oh, Lord. Remember the uh, a little book that I wrote called Examining the Armed Citizen and how I in that book, there's a specific detailed event where a man was stabbed multiple times on a subway in new york and attempted to sue the city because there were two transit police officers on the other side of a glass door while he was being stabbed they did nothing and they said he didn't specifically ask for their help so the state is not responsible that's ridiculous um, the issue of New York subways loomed so large that Justice Alina Kagan appeared to endorse the notion that they are sensitive places. After being questioned by Chief, She's a communist. Chief Justice John Roberts as to what might constitute a sensitive place, uh, NYSRPA counsel Paul Clement responded with how a location might be analyzed. He offered in part, quote, one is, you know, restriction of access to the place and something is something that I think would be consistent with the way government buildings have worked and schools have worked. Not any member of the general public can come in there. They restrict access with or without a gun. If you're an adult that has no business being in the school, you're excluded. So I think that's a factor that would support treating that as a sensitive place. That's in regards to the subway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kagan pressed the topic by asking communist. What the chief justice is trying to do is figure out how those cash out in the real world. So I'll give you a few more New York City subways. Um, the notion that, and we're getting to the crime here. It's yeah. a pretty a disgusting thing, but oh, the notion that New York City's subway system is a sensitive place under any conceivable definition of the term should be absurd to any person who has had the displeasure of using it. The utterly filthy structure frequently plays host to the most outrageous scenes of crime and human degradation. However, a recent incident illustrated just how non-sensitive the New York subway system is, in fact, and made it clear that the state of New York doesn't consider it a sensitive place in practice. According to police, on February 21st, a 43-year-old woman was on a bench in a subway station in the Bronx when a man approached her. The man was carrying a plastic bag filled with human excrement when he pushed it into her face. Which, oh, which he pushed into the woman's face. And an account from the New York Post stated that the man smashed the vile contents of the bag in her face and then speared it on the back of her head. The entire attack was captured on video. Police arrested the alleged attacker on February 28th, and he was arraigned on March 1st. 
and released immediately. The, this gets really ridiculous. The, fur, the further we go, the more angry you're going to be. While he was detained, the suspect reportedly joked about his alleged crime. The New York Post res- reported that he told the police, uh, crap happens. Ha ha. This is a crappy situation. Ha ha. Yeah. The Post also noted that during his arraignment, he snapped F-U-U-B-I-T-C-H to the judge and referred to the victim as a B-I-T-C-H. Despite the atrocious nature of his alleged crime and outrageous courtroom conduct, the suspect was released without without bail. What? Thank you, New York, you stupid moronic scumbags. It's, it still gets worse. Oh, it's, days, it's worse. Oh, yeah. Two days after being released, this it gets way worse. Two days after being released, the suspect was rearrested on hate crime charges stemming from anti-Semitic assault last September. So this was prior to the poop bag. The crap bag. There we go. According to the post summary of the charges, the suspect allegedly spat on a Jewish man as he chased down a Brooklyn street screaming, come here, you effing Jew. I'm going to kill you. The suspect was again released without bail. A further investigation of suspect's criminal history showed that he had 44 prior arrests. 44 44 prior arrests. And then WABC reported authorities say that the suspect has a history of transit related attacks. On January 7th, he allegedly punched, punched a 30-year-old man on the subway platform at the 125th Street Station at Lenox Avenue in Harlem. On February 5th, he allegedly punched a 53-year-old man on, at the Port Authority bus terminal. Jared, what do we? What quote did we have from Jeff Cooper last week about criminals? Uh, I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like the criminals... The only way to stop the criminals is to make them afraid of their victims. Right. Uh, I'm going to pull it up so you guys can remember. If This is Jeff Cooper. If violent crime is to be curbed, it is only the attended victim who can do it. The felon does not fear the police. He fears neither judge nor jury. Therefore, what he must be taught to fear is his victim. If this isn't the perfect example of why Cooper was absolutely right, I don't know what is. This guy, this scumbag obviously doesn't fear the police. He doesn't fear being arrested. He doesn't fear the courts. Why should he? 44 prior arrests. I want to know how much it costs per arrest to run this dude through the court system. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Um, New York City, you get what you pay for. Actions have consequences. You put Democrats, socialists, and flat-out communists in charge, and this is what you get. And I don't feel sorry for you. Sorry, I don't. The whole basis of this argument is unfounded anyway because we have if we've if you guys have been paying attention to the grad program we've been studying this political thought of the american revolution book which we're going to finish today on uh, the friday yeah. episode on the friday episode yep yeah. but this whole argument is baseless because the purpose of the government is supposed to be to defend individual liberty and, and secure protect the rights secure the natural rights of man not to take them away not to hand them out like candy not to charge you for them not to hold them hostage and we're talking the purpose about, of government is to secure your rights as an individual. Yeah. And and we're talking about in this thing, we're talking about uh, trying to ransom your rights back to you is what they're doing. Yeah. And it's even worse in New York because it's it's a May issue. So you have to get on your knees and beg for permission. Just I, I got a question. Does this this piece of human excrement uh we in New call York a bag of human excrement? This bag of human excrement, does does he is he begging the uh, the state for permission? No, no. <sighs> All right, moving on. We got other fish to fry here. So that's your student of the gun homeroom. Some people are dangerous on demand, and some people are just helpless victims because they vote for Democrats. We have got to, at some point in time, uh stop acting like puppets that are so easily manipulated by the media 
it dumbfounds me, Jared, that people who, if you ask them, what do you think about the COVID crisis? And, the, and they would say, oh, pandemic and, you know, the CNN and the NBCs and the, you know, they all push this and they pushed the fear campaign and they, they manipulated us. And you say, oh, yeah, right. And I changed my Facebook status to Ukrainian flag. Why? Why did I hate Putin? Well, why? Because the media told you to. Did you? And this question is, you know, people started putting masks on. I asked, I would say, what mask did you wear during the swine flu? What, what are you talking about? What mask did you wear during the bird flu? Oh, I, I didn't. What mask did you wear during SARS COVID part one? Because we've already had SARS COVID in the United States. What mask did you wear then? I didn't. Oh, so you didn't wear a mask during COVID part one, SARS part one. You didn't wear a mask during swine flu. You didn't wear a mask during bird flu, but now you are. Why? Because the TV told you to? How about thinking for a second? So how did you feel about the Ukraine crisis last year. You didn't think anything of it, did you? You didn't give one fat rat's rear end last year, did you? How about when uh, the Russians basically annexed Crimea? How did you feel about it then? Crime what? Crime, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. That happened exactly. In, uh, like 2012 or? I think it was 14. 2014. Um, what did you think about that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but Ukraine is a, is a wonderful, they're a, a land of freedom and democracy. They are. Didn't the current president put his political rival in prison? What? No. What? Maybe? I, I have no idea. I have no, I have no idea. Um, and you know, it's funny, Jared, is Putin brought up the neo-Nazism in and people are like, there's Nazis in America. You think that Russia should invade America to denazify us? Um, there aren't Nazis who control entire regiments of the army in the United States. Have you seen the, the video from the, the, uh, the Ukrainian youth camps where they're doing the Heil and the Ukraine Uber Alice? Yeah, those are out there. They have that? Yeah. Well, no, they're a wonderful place for democracy and freedom and liberty. Really? Is that true? Did you know that Ukraine, um, in order to minimize uh, the, uh, uh, the effects of Russia, made speaking Russian illegal? They passed a law telling you if because a good part of the western part of Ukraine are Russian descendants and they speak Russian. They're like, you're not allowed to do that anymore. I didn't know. No, they're free. They're they love freedom. They're they're like they're like America in 1776. Ukraine is like they love freedom. Do they? You don't know. You have no idea. All you know is that the TV told you to hate Russia and to hate Putin. And I'm not saying you should love him, but the idea that you should blindly just Oh, you, you know, uh, the, yeah, about, uh, the freedom fighters. Really? How about America? All these people that changed their Facebook status over to the Ukrainian flag. What have you done to fight for freedom at home? All of a sudden, the left. Okay, when George Soros, Hillary Clinton, both tweet about the need for the America to intervene in Ukraine. That's when I hit the brake pedal with both feet. When CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times all jump in and start screaming about we need to intervene in the Ukraine. That's what I'm, I'm going to hit the brakes hard. No. So what you're telling me is you believe that CNN has been lying to you about the COVID pandemic for two plus years. You're like, yeah, they, I know they've been lying. I know they've been carrying the water for the administration. I know that. 
And so they start telling you what's going on in Ukraine. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't think they're lying about that? Oh, no, they wouldn't lie about that. Hey, Zach, how many Hello. false flag propaganda operations have been exposed in the last week? At least like seven. If, if you really want to open your eyes, the, the Miss Ukraine takes up arms to fight Putin lie that didn't happen. The, the ghost of, of Kiev shoots down six Russian MiGs. It was, you know why they had to pull it down, Zach? Because, because the, video the video game, game company that yeah. owned the footage threatened to sue them. Yeah. It was, and, and they're like, and the, the father crying as he says goodbye to his daughter getting on a train. That was a Russian soldier. That was a picture of a Russian soldier leaving. That wasn't a Ukrainian. Oh, really? Yeah. Stop being so easy to fool. You say, well, this is new. And this is when you say, well, this is all new. We, we, we've never had to deal with state-sponsored propaganda to try and get us into a war before. Really? For those of you that were deprived of an education because you went to a public school in the last 25 years, we're going to help you. Jared, will you please um, open up the first Smithsonian uh, article? We're going to remind people what happens when you allow the newspaper to manipulate you into just believing what the state wants you to believe. It says... The U.S. confiscated half a billion dollars in private property during World War One. I. I wonder if that's half a billion dollars in no, that World was in, War One time, or it was in World War One money. Yeah, July nineteen eighteen. Eric Postel wrote a poem. It wasn't a very good poem. He could write later, and it wasn't, and it was decidedly not for publication. But it landed him in an American internment camp for seventeen months. It began like this. Six little aviators went flying out one day. They wished to go to Koblenz and never came away. The poems six, presumably American aviators, bumbled through Germany, each failing or falling victim to the varied ravages of gout, Munich beer, <laughs> and a well-known general, Eric Ludendorff. Possel was a young editor and translator who immigrated from Hungary, Aust Austria, Hungary, sorry, in 1914. His nationality, like that of millions of German speaking immigrants in the United States during World War I, attracted suspicion and anger from nationalistic Americans. In the course of the war, the federal government registered about half a million enemy alien civilians spied on many of them and sent approximately 6,000 men and a few women to internment camps. Perhaps more strikingly, it seized huge troves of private property with dubious relevance or relevance to the war effort. Ultimately amassing assets worth more than half a billion dollars close to the entire, entire federal budget of pre-war America. Yep. Good Lord, can you imagine only having a half a billion dollar budget? Yep. Instead of a 30 trillion or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, here's how Posset's poem ended. Two little aviators got cold feet on the run. One lost all the breath he had. Then there was only one. One little aviator soon to an end was brought. He grieved so for the other five. He too at last was caught. The Department of Justice, which found this poem during a search of his home, was not amused. It is far from being a joke, read an internal report from the Bureau of Investigation, a precursor to the FBI. Mm -hmm. There are now too many good American boys giving up their lives in the aviation department to have an enemy alien attempt to make a joke out of it. There is no excuse for writing this poem, and there can be no excuse offered. All right, so let's just go ahead and pause right there. What happened to the First Amendment? What? Yeah, so uh, in 1917, 1918, the Bill of Rights was suspended. The Bureau of Investigation 
just decided to throw someone in an internment camp for writing a poem of which they did not approve. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't Russia. This is not the Soviet Union in 1927. I think that they this were is probably, the United States of America. They were probably going to throw him in there anyway, because to to find the poem, they first had to yeah. search his house. Oh, yeah. Keep well, keep going. It says that his house had been searched multiple uh, times. Oh, I thought that was the last of the story. No, no, no. Oh, it these keeps going. ads. Dang, they got me. It's like a, f- a look at the cartoon that that was that was in the New York Herald. The enemy menace is hovering over New York. Jeez. Federal agents had been looking for a good reason to arrest Apostle. They'd searched his home around a dozen times in the year prior. Wow. Yeah. What? What? Whatever happened to the Fourth Amendment? Yeah. That's... Doesn't count. Doesn't matter. Now that they had one, they sent him to Fort Oglethorpe, Oglethorpe. Georgia. Or Oglethorpe. Oglethorpe. There we yeah. go. Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. One of the main, the four main internment camps built during the war. Even after they found the poem, though, they didn't charge him with any particular crime. Possible is not, this is a quote from a report. It says, Possible is not accused of any conspiracy, but is only accused of guilty knowledge. He is, that is freaking alarming. That's psycho. That's 1984 stuff. And this is the United States of America. It said, and then the report continued. He is very bright in his writings, and might cause trouble if released. He might cause trouble. This is ridiculous. He has he has thoughts of which we do not approve. Oh, uh, wow! So, Congress passed. Dang, I need two to bills. The rest of this. I I won't do it now, but I just I didn't know that there was more to this story. Yeah. All right, so uh, essentially, what, and you say, all right, come on, Paul. First of all, you didn't know about this, did you? Because you weren't taught in school that in during World War I, you thought that internment camps started with FDR. And if you're a Democrat, which you're not because you're listening to me, um, you say, well, yeah, but that only was a one-time thing, and that never happened before or after, and it's not that big of a deal, I mean, because it was just the Japs, right? Um, folks, Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States during World War I, was a full-blown progressive socialist. Everything that happened to these German Americans, what happened to the Bill of Rights? That's crazy. So the government seized their, declared a state of emergency and seized their property and threw some of them without charges into an internment camp. Uh, what? Yeah, bet you didn't know that, did you? The right of the people to be secure in their persons, papers, and houses and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Um, No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. Well, I mean, unless it's an emergency and there's a Democrat in the White House, then we just throw that in the garbage um, and we just let it happen. Now, my question to you is, do you not think that the people of the United States of America knew what was going on? Were they able to to seize all this a bill, half a billion dollars worth of property and round people up and send them to internment camps during World War I without anybody knowing about it? And you say, well, no. Well, I will say <clears throat> it is a lot easier to know about things nowadays. Like, like nowadays, if, if this were to happen in Georgia, people in New York would know in 15 minutes. Yeah. Well, so. th- here's the thing. This guy was taken from where he was found and put on a train and sent down to Georgia. The reason that the people of the United States looked the other way and didn't push back was because, A, the human condition of, well, it's not me. You know, they came for the... They came for the socialists. They came for the union workers. They came for the Jews. And when they finally came for me, there was no one left. Okay. Probably but, propaganda too. 
be a 100% propaganda. The reason I mentioned this cartoon, this the enemy among us, was because that was common. Remember, the Hearst oligarchy controlled the papers. So every day, do you know what the Germans were referred to, how they were referred in World War I? What was the slang? Krauts? No, the Huns. The Huns are at the gate. The Huns are coming. The Huns, they used to put pit, you know, pencil drawings in the papers of, of Hun soldiers. And it was, it was said that the Hun soldiers were bayoneting babies. They were killing babies. And they were monsters. And so throughout all the papers, the German Huns, the Hun is coming. And it was propaganda. William Randolph Hearst was a master at propaganda. If, if you want to look at things, look for, just put in your favorite search engine, the Hun or Hun propaganda. German soldiers were, with spiky helmets were portrayed as monsters and butchers who were bayoneting babies. So, and your neighbor who speaks German, well, they're just as bad as that guy over in Europe who's bayoneting infants and children. You have to beat back the Hun. And if that means giving the government extra constitutional power, well, then that's what we need to do. I mean, there's a war on, haven't you heard? We can't be clinging to this Bill of Rights in this Constitution while there's a war going on. Did you boys just look up the Hun posters? It was some hardcore propaganda. And that went on every day in the United States. And your idiot relatives... And your idiot, you know, our idiot relatives, <laughs> our, our ancestors, them. they when when German Americans were being rounded up and sent to internment camps, when the federal government was seizing their property one hundred percent illegally, they they looked the other way. They looked the other way, or they endorsed it, or they're like, yeah, screw those. Krauts, screw those Huns. They're they're the enemies amongst us. I think it's good that the government's taken their property. Because after all, I mean, every day in the in the in the paper, whether it's the Detroit News or the New York Times or whatever, every day in the paper, they tell me how evil these people are. So I don't have any mercy for them. We've talked about how the story about how uh, our family changed their last name in World War II from Brinkerhoff to Brinkman because Brinkman sounded more American. And there was such a, an anti-German persecution. How did an anti... I mean, the United States, especially in the 1800s, going into the early 1900s, was the land of immigrants. We had immigrants from every country in Europe flocking to the United States. That's when they came up with the, the great melting pot. This is great. It's wonderful. We have immigrants from every country in Europe coming to the United States for freedom and liberty and opportunity. And then 20 years later, they're all Huns. They're enemy aliens. You need to allow the government to seize their property. And if they don't cooperate or if they have dangerous ideas or they write a poem, lock them up. How much of this video are we going to play? Um, at least, well, let me see, at, at least uh, five to ten minutes. All right. Okay. So that was the history of World War One. So your your relatives were all got all ginned up about the threat of the Hun. We allowed a Democrat president to throw the Constitution in the garbage. 
and act illegally and extra constitutionally and take citizens without charges and th- and lock them up and seize their property. And your relatives, our great grandparents did nothing about it because why? Because the newspaper told them it was the right thing to do. World War II, a Democrat signs an executive order, executive order 9066. What was the order the stormtroopers carried out? Order 66. It was 66, wasn't it? Also, it was clone troopers. Not Execute clone order troopers. 66. The clone troopers. Execute order 66. So FDR was just following with the FDR was a progressive socialist. I mean, he had a D behind his name, but he's a progressive socialist. So World War II happens. Boom. Time to spin up the internment camps. Yep. Now you ask Democrats about this today. They're like, hey, how do you feel about those internment camps? They're like, that was horrible. And that's a, a scar on the on the history of the United States. And it's a terrible thing. You say, well, who that- did that? Well, the Congress did it. Those evil Republicans in the Senate did it. Now, I'm going to say this, though. I don't know if they would say that, because until we started talking about this like three months ago, I didn't know this this had happened. Until you, you brought realize? it to my, I did, and I did not know that there were American internment camps in World War One and Two. Oh, until you started bringing them up. So, well, I feel if like you ask someone want... my age, what do you think about internment camps? Well, yeah, like, terrible, horrible, a, an abomination. We owe those people reparations. Okay, and you say, how did it happen? Oh, the Congress and the Senate were filled with evil Republicans, and they all voted for it, and they passed a lot. No, no. How did the German Americans have their property stolen and end up in internment camps? Well, it was an executive order from old Woody Wilson, progressive socialist. So fast forward a couple decades. Why did the Americans think it was okay for their Japanese neighbors in California, Washington, Oregon to be rounded up and put forcibly into internment camps? Well, because the newspapers told me about the the Jap the Japs, man, and the Japanese menace and the enemy living around us. And it was all done by a progressive socialist president using an executive order. And the newspapers told the your you know, your grandpa and grandma and your great grandpa and your great grandma, they told him it needed to happen. Because they were an enemy within. And the Constitution during time of war, we, we got a war going on. Now, do I need to remind you that Wilson used our involvement in World War I and our, um, the fact that they spent all of the federal budget and we were broke to push the 1919 income tax law, income tax bill? What? Yeah. You see... There was no individual federal income tax until Wilson and World War I. And they sold it as like, well, I mean, you love your country, right? Oh, you hate your country? You want to pay your fair share, right? Don't worry. It's a tiny, small, infinitesimal amount. Just give us the authority to tax you so we can pay off the war debt. We'll pay off the war debt, right? Uh, okay. What happened to that? What did we fail to learn? No tax ever goes away and it always gets bigger. Once you let the camel put his nose under the tent, he's not going to back out. He's just going to keep coming in. Woodrow Wilson, the progressive socialist piece of human garbage, pushed us into... Most Americans, you guys don't realize because you weren't born and your parents weren't born. Most Americans, this is that's a, my note to remind you guys, uh, did not want to get involved in World War One. And we had the Monroe Doctrine. And they said, "Hey, that's not that's not our uh, our circus. Those aren't our monkeys. We don't need to be involved in that." But 
Wilson wanted us to be involved in the war, and he pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed till finally he got us in the war. Then the war ended, and he said, we're broke. We spent all that money winning the war, and you love your country, right? And if you don't allow us to pass the 19th Amendment, which was never properly ratified, but that doesn't matter, um, then you hate your country, right? And it, that was the excuse to institute a national federal income tax that heretofore did not exist. And this is when you go, oh, I didn't know that. Jared, were you, in, were you taught that in school? No. No, of course not. You can't teach people that in school. All right. So two instances of American citizens being abused by their government while their neighbors stood by and watched because the media, the newspapers, and the radio told them that their neighbors were bad people. And you love your country, right? If you don't, if you don't get behind the Washington, D.C. narrative, the Huns are bad, the Japs are bad. Uh, if you don't get behind that, well, you're not an American. So here we are, open book test on history, and we're failing it again. Zach, this video uh, is extremely important. This is a professor at the University of Chicago. And uh, you need to watch, you guys in the audience, the link's in the show notes. You need to watch the whole thing. Watch, it's the last like half hour's Q&A, but at very least, watch the first 45 minutes. Zach's going to start it. Now, this speech was given in 2015 after the Russians annexed Crimea. And he lays out the case and explains how we got here and what we we're doing wrong. Zach, go ahead and start it. Conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is that Putin is the main cause of the crisis. Some say he's either crazy or irrational. Angela Merkel was making this argument for a while. He's bent on creating a greater Russia, and he bears marked resemblance to Adolf Hitler say a few words about each of these. Uh, I know a great deal about Adolf Hitler. I've written and I teach extensively on uh, uh, Nazi Germany's behavior in the 30s and during World War II. The idea that he bears any resemblance to Adolf Hitler is laughable in the extreme. It's hard to believe that serious people make that argument. Uh, the idea that he's bent on creating a greater Russia, I think if he could do it, he'd do it. He can't do it. Uh, Russia is a declining great power, and as I said to you before, if they were to try and create a greater Russia by invading Ukraine and by invading the Baltic states, they'd be jumping into the briar patch. In fact, again, if you want to wreck Russia, what you should do is tell them to try and create a greater Russia. Uh, it will lead to no end of trouble. I think Putin is much too smart for that and he is in the process of wrecking Ukraine. I want to make that clear. And he's wrecking Ukraine because he's basically saying to the West, you can't have it, and I'll wreck it before you take it. Is he crazy or irrational? I don't think so. Uh, I think he's very strategic. Uh, and I don't think he's the main cause of the crisis, as I said to you. Another set of arguments associated with the conventional wisdom. This is that the United States is a benign hegemon seeking to promote European stability, seeking to promote stability in Asia all over the globe, and so forth and so on. There are some countries like Japan and Germany, for sure, Poland, who view the United States as a benign hegemon. There are many countries out there who do not. Iran is one, China is another, and Russia is a third. They just don't see it that way. And because they don't see it that way, you should understand that when you take measures, you meaning the United States, that you think are going to be interpreted as benign, the other side will not see them that way. They will see them as threatening. Uh, this gets back to my point about democracy promotion. We believe democracy promotion is an unalloyed good, and we can't understand why people like Putin and the leaders in Beijing don't understand this, but they don't understand it. And if you don't recognize what other people think, uh, you're incapable of putting yourself in their shoes. You're going to get yourself into a heck of a lot of trouble. Uh, and of course, that's exactly what happened here. Uh, and then another argument is that Putin's behavior proves that it was wise to expand NATO eastward to try 
to include Ukraine and Georgia, right? What's very interesting is that there is no evidence that we thought Putin was aggressive before the crisis. There's no evidence that we thought that. There's no evidence that we were talking about expanding NATO because we had to contain the Russians. Because again, NATO expansion was driven by 21st century men and women. They believe balance of power politics is dead. That's what happened here. Do you understand? Putin is a 19th century man, right? He does view the world in, balance of power poli in terms of balance of power politics, as do we when it comes to the Monroe Doctrine in the Western Hemisphere. But in this case, in the case of Europe, we were thinking like 21st century men and women. And we thought that we could just drive right up to his doorstep and it wouldn't matter, right? We did not think that Russia was aggressive. What happened here is that after the crisis broke out on February 22nd, we then decided that Russia was aggressive. We then decided that Russia was bent on creating a greater Russia. It was after the fact. And by the way, this is why President Obama and virtually all of Washington was caught with their pants down when this crisis broke out after February 22nd because they did not see it coming. Talk a little bit about our response. We're basically doubling down. Uh, we're getting tougher and tougher with the Russians. That's our strategy. Uh, and that's exactly what you'd expect if you're going to blame them, given that we're incapable of blaming ourselves because we never do anything wrong. You all know that. All the problems in the world are caused by everybody else, never by the United States, because we're a benign hegemon. Well, if we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and they're misbehaving, they're bent on creating a greater Russia, oh my God, this is the 1930s all over again. Any sort of concession to Putin is Munich, October 1938. You can't do that, so what you do is you double down. You get tougher and tougher. Uh, then this brings us to the question of whether we can succeed or not. My argument is you're playing a losing hand. Right? And the reason you're playing a losing hand is because this is a competition between economic considerations and security considerations. The basic mindset of people in the West is that you can punish the Russians economically and they'll throw their hands up. My argument is when security considerations are at stake, when core strategic interests are at stake, and there's no question, ladies and gentlemen, in Russia's case, this is a core strategic interest, countries will suffer enormously before they throw their hands up. Right. So you can inflict a lot of pain on the Russians, and they're not going to quit. And they're not going to quit because Ukraine matters to them. And by the way, Ukraine doesn't matter to us. You understand there's nobody calling for us to fight in Ukraine. Even John McCain, who up until recently has never seen a war he didn't want to fight, <laughs> right, is not calling for using military force in Ukraine. What John McCain is saying is, not, is that Ukraine is not a vital strategic interest for the West. That's what he's saying. It is a vital strategic interest for the Russians. They've made that perfectly clear. And not just Putin, right? So in terms right, of balance of resolve, it's all on their side. And I showed you that slide. You guys need to watch this. On your own time, open up this and watch it. This guy, and remember, this is in 2015. This is him talking about what happened with Crimea and explaining it. What did he just say? When it comes to a, we view it economic versus security concern. What is going on in Ukraine started because NATO, the NATO nations, the United States and England and so forth, started expanding and pushing their influence towards Russia. And we all think, oh, NATO's all the good guys, and we like them, and they're good. And, and how could anybody not see that, that NATO's the good guys? Russia doesn't see, and Russia and the former Russian states, Belarus and the Ikhstans and all that, they don't see NATO as this hero and this savior. They view NATO as the enemy, as a threat to their national security. Well, that's not true. It doesn't matter whether you think it's true or not. In Asia and in Europe, you know, in the former Soviet Union, they view NATO as a threat to their national security. And so we, the United States, under Clinton first and then Obama, start pushing. We're like, no, we're, we're going to put Georgia, you know, Soviet Georgia, we're going to put Georgia into the, U, into the NATO. We're going to put Ukraine into NATO. 
And the Russians like, no, you're not. Like, oh, yeah, but we are. And they're like, no, you're not. You're not. That would be like if Russia went to Cuba and set, and set up. Remember when? Yeah, well, you guys remember because you didn't learn nothing. You didn't learn anything in school. When, when Russia, who was an ally with Cuba, Castro was buddies. They're like, hey, we're going to give our buddy Castro a bunch of missiles. We had a conniption fit. Like, no, you're not. You're not going to bring Russian military hardware, Soviet military hardware, and park it in Cuba. Like, yeah, but Cuba's a sovereign nation. You can't stop us. But we did. We almost went to World War III to try and stop the Soviet Union from putting their weapons in Cuba. Because we said, Monroe Doctrine, this is our playground. You don't come to our neighborhood, right? So, but we... The United States and and Europe, we're, we say to Russia, here's what we're going to do. We're going to come to your neighborhood. We're going to come right up to your back door in Ukraine, and we're going to put our NATO missiles there. And we act shocked and surprised that Putin be like, no, you're not. Oh, yeah, but we are. No, you're not. And. In the video, he said the reason that Ukraine is in trouble is because we we got behind them. How many times were you guys in school and you wanted to fight? You wanted to see a fight and you knew people. So the people, the other people got that one kid and they pushed him into fighting that other kid because they wanted to fight. Right. So we're pushing Ukraine. We're like, hey, don't don't sweat it, Ukraine. We got your back. We got you. Do you guys understand and know that in 2004, the, that the country of Ukraine was the third most powerful nuclear superpower in the world? No, they weren't. Yeah, they were. Read some history. Why aren't they now? Because Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, and I think it was Boris Yeltsin, they had the 2004 nuclear disarmament accords. They went to Ukraine. They're like, hey, buddies. You got all these nuclear weapons, and that's making us nervous. You don't want those, do you? And, and the Ukraine's like, yeah, we kind of do. And they're like, eh, you kind of don't. And so Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, I think I'm pretty sure it's Tony Blair at the time, uh, they're like, here's what we'll do. We'll come up with a non-proliferation nuclear disarmament, and we promise to keep you safe. And we'll give you economic opportunities and we'll openly trade with you if you will only surrender your nukes. And so the Ukrainians believed us, big mistake. They listened to us, big mistake. And they're like, okay, we agree. And they gave them up. But who'd they give them up to? Where did the Ukrainian nukes go? Jared, Zach, do you guys have any guesses? The Russians. Yep. <laughs> so Ukraine in 2004 was the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. More than China, more than England, more than France. And we, Bill Clinton and Blair and whoever was in charge of Russia at the time, I'm pretty sure it was Boris Yeltsin, convinced them to give their nuclear weapons to Russia. Because they told him, hey, if anything ever happens, we got your back. We'll protect you from outside aggression. No one will ever take advantage of you because we, we're we there for you. Whereas if Ukraine would have just kept its nukes, they wouldn't be in the problem that they're in right now. You're not supposed to know that, though. You're not supposed to know that Bill Clinton, that the West talked them into disarming. You mean disarming and, and, and relying on someone else to protect you is not a good thing? But it worked out great in New York. Let us take your guns and don't worry. If you need someone to protect you, that's what the police are for. You see, like on a grander scale, what we do, we make promises. Don't worry. Just surrender your guns and arms because guns are bad. Nukes are bad. Don't worry about it. We have the, the American policeman will take care of you. And then the Ukraine gets mugged and raped. And they're like, hey, American policeman, you were supposed to stop me from getting mugged and raped. They're like, well, it's 
Eh, I know, but don't you feel glad that you don't have those nukes? That agreement was 20 years ago. Ah, yeah. It was 18 years ago. Who cares? Um, and then, then in 2014, when Comrade Barry, see, Comrade Barry was the president of the United States at 10 years after Bill Clinton made that promise. You see, Clinton promised to never allow Ukraine to be abused or invaded, and we would stop it. And Russia's like, you know what? We've, we're going to take Crimea. And they did. And what did Obama do? He did nothing. <laughs> he was like, well, hey, you shouldn't have done that. But now that it's done, I, I don't, I'm going to go give weapons to ISIS. Bye. Why does the world listen to us? Democrat presidents always make the world a more dangerous place. Do, do, I, do I need to point this out? And so my point is this to you guys in the, my audience who've all changed your Facebook profiles to the Ukrainian flag. Before you get on the, the we hate all Russians and let's dump out the Russian vodka and blah, 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 blah. First of all, understand and, and be at, at very least honest with yourself that it's virtue signaling at its best. This dumping out Russian vodka, the Russians already got paid for that. Okay. The only people you're hurting is the American distilleries and the American distributors, the, the people who already paid for it and now can't sell it. They're the ones getting hurt. The Russians already got their money. It's virtue signaling and it's ridiculous. And we've got so many, we've got a literal dementia riddled meat puppet calling the shots in Washington or being told by a, you know, deep state or whatever, what to do. Your gas prices, you're about to be at the point, Jared, last year when I, I said, you're going to end up at a point where it's going to be everything you can do to pay for food and fuel. All of your disposable income is going to go to food and fuel. Last year, I said that. And it's about to happen. Why? Because you won't stop listening to the media. Think. Read history. Understand how they manipulate you. And stop being so easy to manipulate. We do not have a national strategic interest in Ukraine. Yeah, but it's the right thing to do. I don't remember seeing a Rwandan flag on your Facebook profile. What do you mean? Well, uh, in the country of Rwanda, they had a genocide where they murdered up to depending on which side you listen to, between a half million and 800,000 people were slaughtered. Why didn't we send troops to Africa to stop that from happening? I've noticed that whether or not America is the world police, like in public opinion, greatly uh, changes depending on who's president, which is very strange. And oh, yeah. When Trump was president, Hollywood's like, we're not the world police. Let people solve their own problems. Now that Biden's president, we need to solve everyone else's problems because it's the moral thing to do. And I, and I said, and people were like, oh, it's the, it's the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to secure your nation. The right thing to do is to protect your nation's borders. The right thing to do is to bring manufacturing back to the United States. All you warmongers, all you like, we need to go and kick Putin's ass. We're going to kick Putin's ass. You know what you need to win a war? Fuel and manufacturing. Kids, you cannot outsource your fuel and your manufacturing and win a war. It doesn't work. We don't produce enough fuel in, on, on purpose. Do I need to remind you that we were, had so much fuel that we could export it under Trump, and now we don't have enough and we have to beg other countries for it? 
Where's our manufacturing, kids? Well, Trump was bringing it back, but he's he tweeted mean. Trump was a mean tweeter. So, yeah. And then we had COVID, so we decided to destroy what American manufacturing we had. I hate to just shake you loose from your, your virtue signaling, America, but we can't win a war against Russia because we don't produce our own fuel and we don't have the manufacturing capacity. Do you understand that? And that situation took place because you were weak and spineless and you allowed a dementia puppet to be installed into the White House. And during COVID, you put your head down and obeyed illegal mandates. You allowed small businesses to be destroyed because you were afraid to speak out. Oh, I don't like this Paul Markle guy. I'm not going to listen to him anymore. He doesn't say what I want to hear. Good. If that's your if that's the case, you're useless to me. I don't need weak people. I don't need people who will blindly obey everything the New York Times says. I need a thinking audience who understand history. That's what I need. All right, tomorrow. Um I said this last week, but we've got this is the crazy thing, Jared. Last week we talked about this and then two more stories popped up. That proved me right. I'm like, well, we're going to have leadership trait for you guys tomorrow. We got a fighting fitness for you guys tomorrow. And American police, and if you wear a badge and a uniform, you might want to pay attention to this. They got a serious image problem. And I'm going to tell you why tomorrow. And then on Friday, we've got, uh, we're going to get into Klaus Schwab and BlackRock. Did both of my sons, did you guys watch the 15 minute video? Of which, JP which Sears, one? JP Sears, explaining I got about halfway through it. <clears throat> you got to watch the whole thing. There's so much stuff to watch. <clears throat> you, I had to. two days to do it. There's not enough time. Well, whatever. Go take a poop and and watch it while you poop. I read while I poop, though. Oh uh, well, whatever. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on Friday, we're gonna we're gonna break it down for you, and we've got information that you need to have because. Well, you just be ignorant and wonder why things are happy, happening or you can understand why things are happening. And then, uh, I, I mean, I don't think we need to do the conclusion, but on Friday, we're going to do the last chapter uh, in the political thought of the American Revolution, and it is going to be the moral basis for government. Uh, you guys, so get your books and get ready for that. All right, that's it for today, kids. Thank you very much for being a part of the Student of the Gun audience. And uh, thank you for showing some love uh, and care to the uh, Duracoat family during this hard time. Uh, And, and of course, everybody else who makes this show happen. All right, if you want to be a member of the grad program and be here tomorrow for all that good stuff, what what do they have to do, Jared? Go to getsotg.com. Follow the directions there. As always, if you have any questions, you can contact Student of the Gun Support. And we will get back to you with the answers to those questions. Yes, indeed. All right. Remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. We appreciate your reviews. If you haven't left a review or updated yours recently, head on over to Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player to voice your opinion. Don't forget to join us at the Student Lounge, a place for like-minded individuals to learn, connect, and support each other. No chicanery will be tolerated. Remember to check studentofthegun.com daily for new free content and giveaways. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. Are you a social butterfly connect with us on instagram facebook and twitter for new content each and every day at student of the gun watch student of the gun tv and videos from our trusted partners on roku apple tv amazon fire tv chromecast and even airplay go to studentofthegun.com for direct links and remember you're a beginner once a student for life